Ooh. As I said in last year's video, I don't really drink, so this is probably like my fifth drink of the year. So we're gonna start off slow. I got a baby one this year, because last year, cheers. Welcome to my worst books of 2023. You guys uh, really seemed to like last year's video and you requested that I do the same thing again, where I drink the bad memories away, or we try to. We try to erase these books from our brains. Please consume alcohol safely. We're gonna go in order, so the best of the worst to the worst the worst worst absolute worst book of the year for me there will be spoilers is what i'm trying to say there will be spoilers because i just need to talk to you about these books like we're kind of in a therapy session together welcome to group therapy oh my god my back is actually burning <laughs> i apologize for actually i don't no 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 i don't apologize for what i'm about to say i'm just gonna say Book number one, Every Summer After by Carly Fortune. Every Summer After by Carly Fortune. Oh, I picked this one up because it is about this young lass who lives in the big, glimmering, gorgeous city of Toronto. And she has spent the last 12 years of her life yearning for the wilderness, the beautiful rural Ontario of her childhood because every summer, up until the age of like entering university she would go and stay in barry's bay ontario and i was like oh my god that's about me this is a book about me because every summer every summer of my childhood pretty much i would go and stay in a cottage also in rural ontario also very close to algonquin park it was the same exact scenery beautiful rural ontario i was excited because i was like this sounds exactly like what I'm going through. I also brought this book on a summer vacation in 2023. I thought it was going to be great. This was so boring. First of all, where was the description of my beloved Ontario? We follow Persephone, who, like I said, she's working in Toronto, and she's been just really upset for the past 12 years, hung up on the same bland man for the past 12 years, which I mean makes sense because he is just as bland as she is. They are made for each other. 12 years? 12 years and you couldn't find anything more interesting. So Persephone met Sam. Sam is a bit of just a cute little ray of sunshine. He really is a golden retriever. He's a brainiac and eventually he goes off to university to study math, I believe. So they meet as like pretty much children, as kids, as like preteenish, I guess, and they just really hit it off. They're best friends. They make friendship bracelets. They do everything together. They're inseparable. And eventually, after they have the conversation where they're like, fine, we're gonna ruin our friendship and we're gonna date, um, things start to go downhill. Something happens and then they stop talking to each other for 12 years. They break up, they're done. 12 years later, Percy gets a call from Sam's brother, Charlie, being like, hey, our mom died. Do you want to come back to uh, the summer house for one last hurrah? Except the hurrah is a funeral, and I know it's not my mom's bones you want to see. <sighs> in case this sounds like the summer I turn pretty, it is. In case this sounds like Love in Other Words by Christina Lauren, it is. Percy gets there, she sees Sam, who's in a relationship by the way, and she's like, oh no. I still love this man. Where? Where is the love? Where is the chemistry? There was nothing. Like, no chemistry. I didn't feel any connection. I didn't feel any spark. It just felt really weird. It really truly felt like I was reading about two cousins or worse, two siblings. Like I was like, where is this? It just feels so weird. More than that, I was rooting the whole entire book for Percy or at least someone to get with Charlie, the older brother. She should have gone with the older brother. I said what I said. Overall, big ick, like massive ick. Carly Fortune was like, what? What can make a romance book better? What makes a romance book really good? What is going to make people feel so good and in love? And she decided that nothing screams romance quite like cheating on your significant other. I really didn't like it. I didn't have a good time. And I was really excited because I was like, oh my god, it's a book set in like places that I've been to. I never really get to read too, too much about stuff like that. It did not capture the beautiful Algonquin, Muskoka, rural Ontario vibes. So, um, don't. I don't recommend. Counting down. Number six. My number six worst book of the year is Defy Me by Tahara Mafi. One of my favorite videos I made in 2023 was me reading the entire Shatter Me series. 
Defy Me is part of the second trilogy that came out years after the first core trilogy of Shatter Me. We have Shatter Me, Unravel Me, Ignite Me, Restore Me, Defy Me, and Imagine Me. So Defy Me is the fifth book in the series, okay? So I already have so many complaints about the second half of the series. Everything is just undermined. Everything after Ignite Me, why? What was the what was the necessity there? Was it monetary? I'm thinking the motivation might have been monetary. Shatter Me, the Shatter Me series about the, is about uh, my God. Shatter Me series is about this girl named Juliet, and she has the power to touch you and make you feel immense pain and potentially kill you. And throughout the series, as it goes along, she just keeps adding on powers to her resume. My problem with the second trilogy is that it just becomes so much like a soap opera. So. First of all, stop making everyone know each other since their childhood. Stop making every relationship, every romantic encounter like, oh my god, wait, we knew each other in our childhood or we grew up together. Like, get it out of here. I don't want to grow up. No, I want to meet someone new. I want to meet someone fresh. I want someone who knows me not when I was this weird little kid crawling around in the mud. They can know me now when I'm still crawling around in the mud. So the relationships obviously in Defy Me kind of hearken to that. And I was just like, I'm not... I'm not into it. I don't like it. I don't like that trope. Second of all, memory wiping. Stop wiping everyone's memory. Stop it. Get some help. I'm begging you. Don't do it. Don't make memory wiping or memory unwiping uh, a plot device in your novel because it's it's stupid. It makes things meaningless. It makes things not make sense. And it's especially bad when you don't even explain how you're doing any of this in the first place. Third of all, stop making people come back from the dead you're done. Maybe they don't want to come back. Did you ever ask your characters if they want to come back to this world? Specifically, I'm talking about Aaron's father, Juliet, because in this world, um, it's ruled over by the reestablishment. So the world has gone to absolute bonkers. Everything is riddled and decimated by climate change. Everything is bad. Everyone's poor. No one has enough to eat, except for, of course, the small group of elite. And Aaron's father, Anderson is the big wig of it all. He's the leader of the reestablishment of North America. This guy gets shot twice in the head, point blank, and he survives. This guy takes a letter opener to his jugular, has his larynx sliced open, bleeds out, and he survives. This guy is taken out with a machete, sliced open with a machete, intestines everywhere. He survives. And my problem with Defy Me especially is that like it she just rewrote everything that we knew and loved and thought we understood from the original trilogy and that would be okay if it was actually good, if it actually made sense, but it it didn't and it was really really boring. The plot literally went in circles. Literally went in circles. At one point they steal a plane, rescue our girl Juliet, drop her off at a resistance base. She gets captured again after already being captured once, after already necessitating the theft and use of a plane to get her back. And then they have to steal another plane to get her back again. The next one I read in December. I picked this book up specifically. This is book number five in our countdown. And I was like, this sounds kind of cute. It's an author that I was disappointed by in the past, but I was willing to give her another go because this novella was set in the Arctic, specifically Svalbard, which is um, an island that I'm very interested in visiting. I think Svalbard is so cool. I would like to go there one day. It's icy, it's snowy, and that's why I picked it up in December, and that's why I was willing to give this like frozen tundra arctic romance a try i was like okay maybe there's gonna be like cute tent scenes we're gonna like keep each other warm it's gonna be fun we're gonna ride polar bears or something i don't know no so i'm talking about below zero by ali hazelwood um when the title and the rating are the same thing that's weird so this is about a girl named hannah hannah's kind of a piece of shit. no like my back is actually burning okay i think i need to turn this down before i kill myself <laughs> hannah <laughs> Hannah decides that she wants to get into NASA. Hannah, her like thing, like she makes it her thing. And it is so just like, why are you doing this? And also it's never explained, but her thing and that she like broadcasts to everyone quite proudly and she talks about it all the time in the novella is that she's just totally emotionally unavailable. She's like, yeah, I don't do emotions. I don't do connections. I don't do friends. I don't do relationships. Like I'm just kind of different like that. Like, okay. 
That's so chic of you. This leads to the main conflict of the novel because she meets Ian, who is employed at NASA, who was on the team of people who landed one of the rovers on Mars. Hannah starts fawning over him before she meets him. She's like, oh my god, he is like my dream job. He is so cool. I want to learn from him. I want to get to where he is. This leads to just something weird. Okay, so she goes to interview him because she's currently a grad student when the novella begins and she's going to interview him for some assignment. Meet at a coffee shop, but then she somehow convinces him to take her back to his laboratory at NASA. I don't think you can just go in there. Like, she's not qualified. She doesn't have any security clearance. She's she, like, you can't just waltz in. And then she starts snooping around all the computers and she sees like lines of code on his screen and she's like, oh my god, are you like debugging right now? Are you like trying to like debug something right now? She is obsessed with Mars, if I didn't already say that. Like, she's obsessed with the planet Mars. She thinks it's so cool. She wants to work specifically with stuff centered around Mars. This is convenient and gets a little weird because Ian, who is the man, Who's our man? I love Ian. He was great. He was like this little cinnamon roll. He was so cool. He doesn't deserve the terror of being in this novella. Ian has red hair, flaming red hair, and bright blue eyes. And immediately, Hannah starts comparing him to Mars. Like, all the time. She's like, oh my god, he's just like Mars with like his red sandy hair and like it's like the sand of Mars and like it's the color of Mars and his eyes are like the ice of Mars. Freud, hi, can you come in here for a second? Okay, cool. Freud here, uh, do you want to f the NASA man or do you want to f Mars? I honestly didn't know. And then they both, anyway. And then he lets her start messing with the code, NASA's code for like making sure that things work properly. He's just like, yeah, go ahead, get your grubby little fingers all over it. And then they start in the NASA facility. Is this allowed? Is this sanitary? The rovers are up there being like, guys, the rover on Mars is up there being like, guys, what do I do? My battery's running out. It's getting cold. And the people on the ground floor are just rolling over the desk, smashing buttons. Meanwhile, the robot on Mars is like blowing up. Anyway, second of all, the thing that everyone who reads Ellie Hazelwood has like really just started to complain about, stop making every main male character Kylo Ren. Stop it. You don't need to make every man as wide as like three of my rib cages. It doesn't need to happen. Why do they have to be so wide? Also, you're a writer. You're a writer. You're supposed to play around with words. Can you not choose a single synonym for big? You have to use the word big 23 times. All the reviews I read were really upset because in the... Oh wait, I didn't even tell you what this is about. She's in grad school and she meets Ian. They sleep together. In NASA. Like fully in NASA. <laughs> inside of NASA. He's like, oh my god, like, can I buy you dinner? Can we go out? Do you want to get to know each other? And she's like, no, no, you know, I'm not, I'm not like that. I'm not like those girls, like, no. And he gets, like, really hurt and upset because he's like, I want to get to know you. I want to be in a relationship with you. And she's like, no. This uh, leads them to five years down the road. He's still obsessed with her. Ian, you deserve so much better. She is super, super angry at him because he, as, like, a person in a position of power above her job, her grad student, whatever, has tried to cancel her research project, which would take her to Svalbard to do something that would help the Mars rover. Okay. She's she's not like, hey, why did you do this or anything like that? She just goes instead, gets approval from another really scammy professor, and what happens? She lands in a crevice in the ice and she can't get out. And the whole novella is about like Ian sacrificing his life to go rescue <laughs> this girl stuck in ice who won't even sit down and have a nice dinner with him. And it's just so boring. But everyone was complaining about how in the sex scenes <laughs> it's literally just him for like five pages comparing different parts of her body to different geographical features, topographical features of Mars. He's like, oh, your tatas are like the Colombian hills of Mars. Honestly, didn't have a problem with that. It's kind of in endearing. What I do have a problem with is, um, okay, can I just ask you all a question about your belly buttons? <laughs> if I even kind of like just graze or accidentally like touch my belly button, I immediately like want to vomit. I don't know what it is. It just makes me so nauseous. I don't know if anyone else has that. However, in below zero, Ian uh, slurps out her belly button like it's a little truffle of chocolate or something and i was like it's the last straw for me the vermilion emporium is that even what it's called by jamie pacton i think lands number four because i literally cannot tell you a single thing about this book my memory has been 
it's been wiped maybe the fbi came to my house i think i swear to god the fbi or someone something came to my house after i read this book and zapped me like gone gone and that's why it's on this list because i have no i have no memory of this place got nothing for you about this one i am so sorry i literally don't remember a single thing about this i know it's young adult i know it's fantasy but i couldn't even tell you if the vermilion wasn't no i couldn't even tell you if the emporium was in fact vermilion or not and i so rarely forget anything i guess it was so unmemorable oh my god i just want to lay down next up we have <laughs> why did i read this why did i read this evie evie's sitting right here in this in this in this <laughs> it's a chair i read the desert king spy by eve longley mm -mm. Uh -uh. This is about this girl named Ashari. She lives in the middle of the desert with her fairly large family until one day her fairly large family becomes fairly small because they all get eaten by gigamanders. They're not salamanders. Oh no, I guess that's kind of saying they're gigantic salamanders. I like j that just clicked into- damn it! Giga. Gigamanders. <laughs> This place is perilous. The desert is filled with weird little monsters like this, like gigantic salamanders. We have like weird dragon pterodactyl things like the thing on the cover. We have just like really weird large monsters. Like someone played Spore and put all of their unhinged Spore creatures into this novel. So she escapes for some reason. She gets picked up by a band of like traveling sex workers slash assassins slash girl bosses. Like, okay, you can come work with us. We kind of feel bad for you. You seem cool. You're an orphan now. Come work with us at our strip club slash politically driven intrigue place and so she does so she's supposed to be sleeping with all of these icky men but in reality she has some sort of affinity or magic to potion making and so she brews them some potion that like makes them think she slept with them when in reality she didn't so this is why one day um she gets chosen as the agent to go and spy on the king of the kingdom because guess what this whole book revolves around these giant ass monsters. We absolutely cannot have these salamanders running around the desert and gobbling up our citizens. Like, it's not okay. The people of, like, not the resistance group or anything like that, but just someone who maybe is like the king's rival, they're like, I just want to know kind of like what his plan is for dealing with these monsters like it's not like a it's not like a true rivalry it's not like coming from a malignant um malevolent place it's literally like these monsters have gotten out of hand and i need to know if our president is gonna do something about it this is supposed to be fantasy romance but the whole book revolved around <laughs> is the king doing anything about these monsters what is his plan it was just so weird so she gets sent to the palace to be like a foreign diplomat she like immediately busts her cover immediately starts making out with the king and then they kind of just team up and then she's like you know what mr king your people are kind of dying like i don't know if you know this but like my entire family was eaten by salamanders and I had to watch that and it was really hard. These gigamanders just like ate them up. It was like as dry as its setting was not good. Really, really, truly just monsters everywhere. Ooh, we're coming down to the last two. The last two. We only have two books left. The 50 Year Sword by Mark Z. Danielewski. I tried so hard. This was nonsense. So this author wrote one of my favorite um, like books of all time, House of Leaves. I love House of Leaves so much. It is so um it's very spooky it's very spooky to me he does weird cool things with writing i don't know it just really felt like a cash grab so this started as like a puppet show a lighting a light show a shadow show it started as a shadow show and it got made into a book i don't recommend doing that okay so i found this at like a at the, the bargain 
keep it together i found this at the in the I found this in the bargain section of chapters and it was eight dollars and it was a hardback when a hardback is eight dollars at chapters no no girl save your money so the 50 year sword is about this halloween party on uh, halloween nights and we have these orphans who are there with their um social worker who looks after them and all of a sudden the storyteller shows up in the middle of the party he's kind of weird he has this like ominous looking box and he starts to tell them all a story about i don't even know what i don't even know what i promise you i tried really really hard with this one um i, have, I even have like a 24-hour readathon where i read this one and the next book and i went into a bit more detail just like a meaningless jumble trying to be cool trying to do something what does that symbol mean Oh, it's overheating. Me too. Finally, the worst book, I don't know, it's not like a the worst book I read in 2023. They were all just kind of bad, but To Be Devoured by Sarah Tantlinger takes the last place because it just like really rubbed me the wrong way. It left me feeling so gross and icky, but totally not in the way that this book intends. This is a horror novel about this girl who wants to eat carrion, who wants to eat dead things. Animals that have recently been killed, I guess, and maybe potentially people as well. But it was just awful writing, like just really, really, truly awful writing. It was so cringy. It was like middle school vibes and like bad writing will always rank lower to me because like the books I talked about before were bad, but at least like their badness was coherent. I don't even know what this was. It was really trying to be so edgy, so dramatic. Everything was for shock factor. So we're following this girl named Andy and she has this girlfriend named Luna. She starts to treat Luna just really poorly. None of it was really explored. None of it was talked about. It was just like things just happened and then you're just left with them in the page and you're like, okay, why is this horrifying? Like it was just weird and gross for the sake of being weird and gross. And the thing that's cool about the weird and the gross is well, like what's behind them, what they mean, how do we construct the weird and the gross, what kind of relationship do we have with the weird and the gross, why do we categorize or think of things as weird and as gross. With that, the 2023 season of bad books comes to a close um there we go i want to know inquiring minds want to know what your worst book was of 2023 thank you so much for watching i hope you enjoyed watching i hope you watched and i hope you i'm just gonna stop talking just stop talking